Well, thank you all for being here. I'm Andy Mendelson. I'm the Associate Dean here at the Newmark J School at CUNY. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you and thank you for joining us for this important conversation. Journalism has never been more important or needed. I don't think I need to say that to you all, but I just did. The complex issues people face require sensitive and nuanced explanations to help people better understand themselves and their communities. Because of this, journalists are being harassed and killed by ch for challenging those in power. At the same time, journalism and journalism education must address a legacy of white supremacy that is baked into the very definitions of what journalism is, how it gets practiced, and who gets to be a journalist. All this requires a re-examination of how journalism is taught and the role of journalism schools uh, in the greater society. We meet the day after another horrifying display of gun violence that has shaken us to our core and reminded us of our seeming inability as a nation to make common sense political choices. As we grieve for those killed in Uvalde, Texas and Buffalo, New York, my hometown, today's topic may feel small and insignificant. And yet, if we believe that journalism can help make a better world, we must soldier on. The idea behind today's conversation was really quite simple. Plenty of newsrooms are engaged in serious reflection about how and why they've lost the public's trust, and especially how they've failed to adequately cover communities of color. Many are holding themselves to account, often very publicly. Yet, unless I missed it, there's been precious little questioning of the role that journalism schools may have played in this equation, even though many now in power in newsrooms got their foundational training in our classrooms. As a still young school, we have very few alumni yet in leadership positions. But we're still eager to think about these questions and to analyze how our own practices need to change. Since I'm the dinosaur here, having been in journalism education for an astonishing 20 years, I'm going to use the privilege of being the host to kick things off with a few observations. And then I look forward to sitting down and listening to what my colleagues have to say. First, despite the understandable focus on curriculum, everything starts with admissions. Especially in today's fraught world, who is likely to want to study to become a journalist? And who can afford to pay or take on more debt for the privilege? That in, the industry tells us that they want to diversify the newsrooms, and newsrooms typically look to journalism schools for help. But have journalism schools recruiting practices evolved sufficiently to meet this stated and urgent need? What college campuses do we visit? And what other avenues should we be pursuing to introduce a wider variety of lived experiences to our applicant pool? What barriers do our admissions requirements inherently erect to those who come from low-income families or those who are products of our nation's highly segregated public educational system with its unequal outcomes? How heavily should we weigh grammar and writing ability in application statements and work samples? What if applicants didn't have an opportunity to participate in campus news publications or felt excluded from them? Does a low undergrad GPA signify that a student didn't study or wasn't smart? Or that they were working two jobs that left them little time to finish their assignments or attend classes regularly? Once admitted, how can we ensure that students have an equitable experience when some can blast through our programs without ever having to work, <coughs> while others are juggling multiple jobs and often additional family responsibilities? When our school opened its doors in 2006, we made several key assumptions. We believed that our program should be full-time because we worried that otherwise students would start but never finish. We assumed that students would be willing to finance an investment in a three-semester program because there were plenty of well-paying jobs waiting for them when they finished. <laughs> and we assumed that online instruction would not be a popular alternative to a more intimate, in-person experience. None of these assumptions, in my opinion, still hold true. Increasingly, our students are demanding more flexible options because a large percentage of them are working while earning their degrees. In some cases, they're holding down two or three jobs. Many are working at least 20 hours a week. This makes it much harder for them to do the reporting outside of class that we require, to meet our deadlines for assignments, and to cope with a workload that was originally designed for full-time students. We now offer students the option of slowing down the pace at which they take courses. And as a result, we have students enrolled 
for four or five semesters. However, that greatly alters the cohort-based experience on which so much of our culture was predicated, and it challenges some of our underlying assumptions about how students progress academically through our intense program. To juggle work and study and further reduce their commute times, some students are now requesting a continuation of the online options that were initially adopted during the pandemic. We worry, however, about the quality of student engagement when video cameras are often kept off and faculty have no way of making eye contact, observing body language, or enjoying the spontaneous interactions that can occur more naturally in person. If we introduce more online options, how can we preserve the important personal connections that emerge during class time and that often translate later into job recommendations and crucial industry networking? Online learning cannot be an inferior option designed for students who cannot afford to attend in person. For some time, our school has been determined to raise enough money to make our school tuition free. And this year, we're proud that 20% of our incoming class will have that experience. But that still leaves the high cost of housing, food, and metro cards. And very few of our students can afford health insurance. If philanthropists truly see journalism as a public good and believe that having more well-trained journalists from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds is essential to our future, then offering more support for tuition and living stipends is a must. I mentioned health insurance in passing, but I want to return to it with more force. The pandemic laid bare the terrible health disparities that exist in this country, particularly with black and brown communities. We are also witnessing a societal crisis in mental health, oftentimes reflecting the trauma inflicted on those who grew up in a world marked by systemic racism. To the extent that journalism schools succeed in recruiting more diverse students, we also need to be prepared to offer more robust mental health services to combat the rise in anxiety, panic attacks, and depression, particularly when so few students have health insurance. I recognize that this may all sound rather gloomy, <laughs> yet I have never been more certain of the need for strong journalism or the value of excellence in journalism education. At a time when the foundational principles of our democratic society are under assault, the fourth estate is more important than ever. And therefore, so too is the responsibility to educate the next generation of journalists with great care and intentionality. I still consider journalism one of the highest callings on the planet. And I can tell you that being the dean of a journalism school is the privilege of a lifetime. I'm confident that those currently or about to become deans will bring fresh ideas, inspiration, and determination to their roles, and I cannot wait to see what they come up with. Now it's time for me to get out of the way. <laughs> so there's a ton of things we can talk about, but, but I really want to center this discussion about how journalism is evolving and what role J schools can play in that. So let me start with you, Ida. Um, you wrote in your inaugural newsletter to the Berkeley Committee when you were appointed dean about how journalism has failed to tell all stories, that a class of mostly white men directing coverage has meant the field has missed the importance of a large range of stories, including being able to, quote, truly see, understand, and empathize with the suffering of alienated white Americans, end quote. So clearly one solution is to diversify the leadership of news organizations, so, but I don't, so what more do you think that newsrooms and journalism schools should be doing to broaden the notion of news judgment, to talk about what is news and what isn't news, and build that sensitivity into your graduates and into the people in positions of power in newsrooms? So two things. Um, one is that definitely diversifying news organizations and the leadership isn't the only solution, but it's a really important solution. Um, when I talked about alienated white folks, I was talking about changing the class as well as the caste and race of journalism organizations as well as journalism leadership. Um, so I think intentionally diversifying has to be a key part of the solution. Um, 
But at a journalism school, for me, coming straight from journalism, I came to the journalism school four years ago to teach one class. Um, but I spent 30 years as a journalist at you know, tiny local newspapers um, and you know, you know, a metropolitan daily and as a foreign correspondent, among other things. But for me, it's um, like the, the answer to that comes in the dialogue between our students saying, what the heck are you talking about? Why aren't we paying our sources? We're discriminating against them. The dialogue between them and us, who at our school are people who spent decades in journalism. So it comes from us saying, I actually don't have all the answers, but you don't either. <laughs> but I'm going to listen to you, and we're going to talk about it. And not being defensive about it, but it's in those conversations that we will find new models and new ways of thinking. I think that there is not a dichotomy as much as there is a need in newsrooms and in journalism programs to be diverse because I start with the premise it's not a number, it's not, it's not the arc, we're not counting two by two, two elephants, two, you know, we're not doing that. It's a yeah. state of mind and we have to think about how we're trying to make sure we bring as many perspectives, so um, not just racial, ethnic, gender, religion, ability, disability, um, um, uh, people who may have, you know, been in the armed services, you name it, we're trying to get as many perspectives um, to be teaching these students. And most of you here who have been in industry like me and all of us, we know there's something we bring to the classroom because we are very much applied program of what we do. We're preparing people to go out there. And so a couple of years ago, me and um, the dean, uh, Dave Pullmiller, who's down in Texas, came up with doing this article together because he said, well, I'm way down here in Texas in this mostly large Latinx population. You're in DC, you know, HBCU, largely African-American population. But let's talk about, you know, what do we do when we recruit and not just us and others. And so I've always felt that uh, newsrooms know this is something they should be doing and also in the professorate we should be doing the same too, thing as well. And so we talked about some things, just a quick synopsis of, you know, we have to change, you know, advertising to recruiting. We have to stop saying, oh, the editor said we can advertise for someone today. We said, no, we have to be recruiting all the time for a professor or for someone uh, to work um, in a newsroom. That is ongoing, that you're constantly talking to people, that even if I'm sitting here today with someone, it doesn't mean that there's something available right now, but who knows, so that we had to be proactive with that. Another thing we said is that we have to, to use, um, I'm changing the term, but it really was wherever you're located using that village. So just because your newspaper is in Iowa or your university is in Nebraska does not mean that someone might not want to come work there. I think in our J schools when we're preparing our students, and all of you know that one of the most fantastic things that can happen is when someone gets the light bulb goes off. You know, you get that one student that they, they get. Um, once we get them past the writing and have to clean that up a little bit. <laughs> um, but we, we also, I think we have to do a better job. If I go back to when I was in undergrad at Michigan State and everybody was talking about, well, I'm going to go work at the New York Times, I'm going to go work at Wall Street Journal. Well, all of us were just not going to work at the Wall Street Journal or New York Times. And we forgot um, how much um, our local and regional papers were important. And I think that's one thing we can do in our J schools too, is to revive that because I'm going to go back to a comment you made about, you know, listening to them as well and helping them understand that our goal is for them to give context to people's lived experiences. And the only way you're going to do that is you've got to cover their lived experiences and they live everywhere. So I can sit up here and say that when I worked at the University of Wyoming, that was a little bit different. <laughs> Ooh, but I uh, cherish that experience. Seven years I s spent out there in administration and teaching because here I was in a rural state, didn't have a lot of back background, but you start seeing similarities of people's lives, their lived experiences, what they were doing. Wyoming is a boom and bust state. And so when things are going well, you know, oil and gas, da -da, everybody's happy, people are working. When they're not, things change. And so you started telling students, but you have to help people understand how they live here. What do they do? So when he and I, and I'm jumping around on purpose, when we started talking about this article, 
and we talked about diversifying faculty. And he said, well, how did you end up in Wyoming? I said, because somebody asked. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we forget to simply do that. It's ask. You know, yes, it's, it's wonderful to be in a New York market, a Chicago market, a DC market, an Atlanta market, a Houston market, but it's also necessary to be in Wyoming. It's also necessary to tell the stories in Nebraska. It's also, surprisingly, what I learned um, of, of the population that had come through Wyoming, and especially African Americans who had come through Wyoming and came out when, you know, you were going out and you were having an opportunity to, to homestead and get land, and found out, you know, I go to Green River, Wyoming, and find this whole Asian population that was there when they were building the railroad. Those stories need to be told. So we have to help students realize that they can dig and that they can find a place where they can make a difference. So not to get them stuck on one place, because it's a journey. So where they may start three, four, five, seven years doesn't mean that's where they're going to end. So I say it's more of us throwing the net out more, even when we challenge them, um, when they have these experiences and they say, well, you know, I heard CBS has an internship in New York and I want to have this. And that happened to me with a student. Um, she was interviewing for a position here in New York, and I was in the Apple store of all places, and she said my whole name, somehow hyphenated names make people want them to say the whole thing. <laughs> and I said, well, why does everybody in the Apple store in Georgetown have to know that I'm in here? And she said, well, I just knew I was going to get the job at NBC. I said, but, but you didn't. And she said, well, what am I going to do? I said, I'm going to look for something else. <laughs> I said, this is fine. You have employment after graduation, but you didn't go to J school to just still be here. And so um, we used the village. We did reach out, and she did land a position. But I think we have to remember, we also have a different generation of students. I can look around this room, and I can you know, give examples of the things that we know about and watching Watergate on TV and all this stuff. And these students did not. And so they, they didn't have that experience of things that you know, they watched them, they lived through them, they covered them. And so they have an experience, and we'll get to that later, where things seem so immediate that somebody will give it to them and line it up, and when we get to social media, they can be an influencer. Um, so we have to remember that we do have to listen to them, but we also have to get them to listen to us. Nicely put. Jelani, welcome. You haven't even started the job yet. So I know Columbia very recently published a very clear-eyed, very honest look at the DEI um, issues at the, at the school and had a long list of recommendations, some of which you know, will take a long time to implement and some of which can be done more immediately. So I'm wondering as you walk into what is called the deanery on the seventh floor of, uh, of the J School, what do you think are your main priorities on this front as you settle in and what impact do you think that might have not just on the school and the students, but on the field more broadly, given essentially how influential the school is? Uh, I'll tell you about my first experience with DEI and Columbia Journalism School. And it happened, as with this discussion, before I actually started there. Uh, and I, I had been interviewed, I'd been hired, I hadn't actually moved to New York yet. Uh, I was in Harlem walking on Lenox Avenue and two, this was in maybe July, and oh, this must have been June, I think my contract started in July. And there were two young women, um, African American, who were recent grads, they had just kind of finished, and they stopped me on the street and said they really wished they had been, they had enrolled for the following year. Uh, and I was like, oh, that's interesting, and I wasn't, thinking this was about me, but they were just talking about feeling that there was a need for more faculty of color um, and more people that they would you know, be able to interact with and presume that their people understood where they were coming from and particular details. I would like to say that that was a one-off conversation. I have had that conversation every semester that I have been at the J School. Um, and, and not always from students, sometimes from alumni you know, who've been like, oh, this is what happened in my time and so on, when there were the issues around that came emerged in the aftermath of George Floyd's death, I was inundated, you know, with people who were contacting me. Some of this was criticism, some of it was just kind of venting, but a lot of it was good faith 
and saying that they would like the institution to operate in different ways. And so when I say that, I don't think that there's anything particular about CJS. I think this is just, that's just the institution where I am and where I'm having these conversations. Uh, and so uh, that's a kind of immediate kind of priority for me. The other thing is that this is not simply about race and ethnicity. Uh, and it's not simply within the purview of the journalism schools because the ugly part of this, which you know we know, and, and my colleague Sheila Cornell, who's in the back, can actually probably tell these numbers better than I, but in, in any given year, two-thirds of our student population is female. And when we look at the industry, there's not two-thirds of the leadership or two-thirds of the workforce. There's that tremendous drop-off. Uh, the same thing that we see with women in law and women in other professions, where they are constituting majorities of the student population and then fizzling out of the career field. Uh, and so just changing the pipeline at our institutions won't automatically solve the problem that we have to confront in terms of changing how the landscape of media looks. That's going to require a lot more and a lot more involvement of stakeholders in different places and a lot of, uh, of change, some of it difficult uh, and so on. Uh, and you know, this is just kind of where we're starting. This is a conversation uh, among deans and I guess a dean elect. Um, but, <laughs> but there has to be another conversation like this among uh, editors in chief and you know, uh, executive producers and people who are uh, managing editors, people who are running uh, media institutions about why their workforce and their leadership looks the way that it does. But beyond diversity, because obviously there's a limited number of faculty, there is a certain rate at which you could replace them. And, and I'm not even sure at the end of the day that having entirely representative faculty will solve all the problems. I think as Gita said about some sensitivity and listening, I was at, and this is all before everybody's time, so we can all say it happened a long time ago, um, the alumni awards um, at, um, at the J School, I was sitting and listening, and, and these two uh, wonderful people from the class of 84, uh, the, the only two openly gay men in that class, according to Steve Cole, got an award, um, an alumni award, and they said, you know, in 84, when they went and they wanted to cover AIDS, and the faculty advisors, with, with a few exceptions, said that's not a story. Uh, and, you know, and, and or, you know, you don't want to be typecast covering this. How do we, and that's not necessarily just a question of, you know, having a more diverse faculty. It's a question of having faculty that can see more of, you know, what might be out there, and especially as we talk about underrepresented stories or underrepresented communities. I mean, is there something that should, can be done in curriculum terms to help? I remember when I was covering drug-resistant TB in India, and I remember uh, discussing the story idea with some editors, and they said, well, wait, 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 what does the WHO think of it? And I was like, mm, why are you asking me that? I mean, I'm in India, and I know it's absolutely a problem in India, and why does it matter what the WHO thinks of it? And it was very much an ethnocentric kind of, like if the WHO, so it was like respecting authority and respecting Western authority, and not seeing, understanding that the WHO is a political entity, and look at them now, like not running in a fight with India over COVID numbers, and I realized that. So I think it's teaching them, which I think we're all doing, but we want to do even more, which is teaching them um, just to value different types of sources and that, that, you know, the source and authority isn't, you know, has their own agenda and um, being just much more mindful of where the expertise is on anything um, in sort of who they choose to believe and quote, uh, but also in how they frame stories. For example, I remember when I wanted to do a book on totally drug-resistant TB, um, the book publisher said, well, you have to have some, some people in the U.S. who have to a drug-resistant TB. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is just an enormous problem in the world. And why do I have to find, like, I felt like I was being pressured to, like, beef up or inflate how important a problem it was here. 
So it's it's creating some sort of curriculum or opportunities uh, for um, people to like truly deeply understand our students for themselves, not us telling them. Uh, they already know they shouldn't, don't want to listen to authority, and even us. There's always. So it's like creating that curriculum and to to help people discover it for themselves. And for us, I guess um, we have you know you do this so well at CUNY, and so many people do, but we have two local publications. Um, we cover Richmond and we cover Oakland, and that's our, our foundational courses cover those communities. And it would be in the in like in the intro classes, I think, that you would really hope to help them do that. Well, as faculty, a former journalist, and you're independent. We're independent. We we want to think and do, but there's ways you can get people to play well together too. Um, two of my colleagues who are with me here, they know she's going to talk us to death on the way home. Uh, Jennifer Thomas and Ingrid Sturgis, but we talk about this, and a lot of times every program has special topics classes that you can have. So you can get people to play with things, to give people, uh, those students who you have the example of alumni should have been encouraged to do those stories instead of pulled back. And so those are things that you know faculty can do. So what we did was, I tried to be creative during the pandemic. So. They know I'm always trying to come up with a theme, something to pull us together. And so I said, well, I'm going to pick a few people and tell, let them tell us what they did creatively to get through switching and having to be online and how did they get people motivated to do things. And there were different creative things that people were coming up with, you know, playing off of finding, you know, different types of stories or reporting them differently. And what we have to learn is I've always felt that if there's a question mark, then it is a story. You have, there's an answer. You want to find the answer. Tell me what you're, you're going to do. And the same case when you were saying someone said, well, prove it over here. I don't have to prove it over here. I'm going to show you. I'm going to tell the story here. So my first job at the former Knight Ritter paper, Akron Beacon Journal, and there was a couple that moved into a suburb outside of Cleveland, and African American couple, and someone burned a cross on their grass. And they were trying to move into the suburb to get somewhere for the kids to go to school, housing. So this whole housing issue came up. And I said, this is a story. And they were like, no, it's not a story. So I tell students, part of being a journalist is, you will stand there and dig in your heels and say, yes, there is a story. And so then I finally got someone to say, well, I would have to go get the story myself. And I said, well, I'll just do just that. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's, it's one of those things where you keep pushing back. And then by the time I'm moving around the state of Ohio and gathering this, and eventually the paper won an award on the, the coverage, I was like, I told you there was a story. Okay. And so we're also teaching that part of that independence, as Jelani was sharing with his nephew, we're teaching that as well, that you are like a dog the bone um, as a journalist in many cases. It's as well as a faculty member, what you're looking at. So sometimes we will hold ourselves back. Oh, I don't want to teach a new course. Oh, I don't want to start a syllabi over. I get it. But you can say, but maybe I can do a different twist with something. That's why I'm kind of stuck on this local um, pushing students, because I feel some of the angst that we had around the country from 2016 election, you know, um, George Floyd and everything, is we weren't telling all these stories that need to be told. If you grew up in uh, Wyoming, because I love, you know, they heard all my Wyoming stories, but I love my Wyoming stories, because they're very interesting. <laughs> because first of all, you, they have different issues there. If you, your family wasn't born there, then you know, you're just a visitor. You know, you're not a Wyoming knight. But there are things that they have to contend with, with weather and things like that. Like you, you can actually freeze to death and die there. I mean, it can, it can happen. And so there's stories about how you have to understand dealing with the weather and living with the weather. There's stories, and I can attest how you have to understand that there is actually wild animals that live around you, called elk and things like that, that are 900 pounds and will stand in front of you and eyeball you. And you better be ready for that, because I wasn't quite ready. But now I'm now. I understand a little bit more. There are stories that need to be told um, what that, those experiences are like, to be told what it's like to live in Nebraska. Um, 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 for Native um, uh, community, indigenous communities in Oklahoma. There's all these stories, and we have to keep trying to excite people to tell them. And as faculty, we have to also look for them to excite us to want to hear them and encourage them. So much of J schools is really about sort of the, the, the craft and the skills of creating stories. How do you report? How do you write? And while I know there are courses, Thank you, Sarah, for reminding me that CUNY does uh, have courses on the engagement and sort of building ties to community and thinking about 
much more of our audience and, and centering a large part of that in, in the work of journalists, which is you know, serving communities. Is there more that could be done? And, and if there is, how do you pack it into curricula that are already completely jam-packed with, with things? But I guess the first question is really, should there be more work about sort of audience and engagement or at least service to community as part of J-Schools? I mean, one place we do it, um, and I'd love to hear your ideas and where else, is ethics. We have a, uh, you know, an ethics class. Um, and we, you know, had a student rebellion against the ethics class, um, and the way that the ethics There's class. There's a theme coming here about student <laughs> yes, rebellion. Yes. But we embraced these rebellions and rethought our whole ethics class, and the rebellion to, um, I forget at uh, whose point it was, I mean, it was about, we were teaching so much of what was interesting to us, you know, Watergate, and people were like, I, you, but we want to know about today, and they wanted to think, you know, debate and discuss these topics about, like, what constitutes a story, what's objectivity, um, you know, what's, how do you report responsibly on communities, how do you engage communities, so we've been doing that, and we've been doing that um, taking turns as the entire faculty teaching it was the solution, teaching different parts of it and teaching it through your own experiences and like the most challenging ethical quandary you were in. Um, so, um, and often, anyway, so it leads back to these larger issues, but, and, and then we have a, you know, it's, there's a, like a, a lecture and then there's a discussion led by an alum who's a recent grad in journalism. Anyway, that's what I did. And that's a, a good way to do it. Like, we talk a lot about modules in classes, because we do have limited time. We have packed curriculum, and we don't. But we talk about modules that different people can put in their classes. So we have, like, three core classes that we said, we don't care what concentration you go in, whether it's broadcast, whether you go digital, whether you go public relations, we don't care. You're going to take the media literacy class. You're going to take the ethics class. You're going to take the intro. Um, communication class and then we said what well, with these modules different faculty can play on things and um, as time goes by you do have to change your examples because they think all of our examples are you know, a little dated but we have to remind them that there's a point we're making but it's, it's sort of like you have to play on it a little bit where you don't have extra classes because we're limited we have to get undergraduates out at 120 credits so we can't add a whole mu much more but we can do modules and things like that. And, and Jalabi is so right when you can go back and talk and do that after with, with things that work, you can say, oh, well, if you try this. And also, one of the things I do miss as an administrator is you don't get to teach regularly. And all of you who were teaching full time know there's some semesters where it just goes good. I like the classes, like they're <laughs> clicking, they're, they're getting it. And then there's some you're like, it's literally pulling teeth. <laughs> you're like, what happened? So you try to learn from those ones that you have and say, oh, I'm going to try this. And I always try to tell the junior faculty who I try to talk to the most is you're growing, so you do get to massage it. So just because you did this in spring 2022 doesn't mean you have to do it the exact same way then. Our point is for you to get whatever the objective was at the end of the class. And so if you want to turn your class into an entire you know, analysis of you know, why did um, a certain event happen at a certain time, then find all the ethical and other elements you want to pull in and try to get them to team or do things to, to do it. But I think we have to stay open to that when we're in these J schools so we don't get caught in what accreditation says I have to give them. But we can still be creative with that. You know, I came to Columbia three months before the 2016 election. Um, and the 2016 election, the day after the election, it was like all hands on deck. You know, we had basically a town hall because there were so many students whose parents were concerned about their safety, you know, being in the United States. And so such a significant portion of our students come from abroad. And, you know, we had to actually, and then there were, you know, American born students who were very deeply unsettled. And, you know, we had to kind of navigate that in what the role of journalism is in a moment like that. Uh, I say that to say that I think that that set part of the context for the subsequent applicant pools. And I think also 
the pandemic and George Floyd, you know, did that. And so we've had these kind of sequential things that have really kind of shaped the thinking of the people who show up in our classrooms. And I think that a lot of them come there with these ideas about ethical questions that, that are really pressing to them. They're at the front of their minds. It's not like we're going to introduce you to these questions about ethics. Mm -hmm. They're like, I have this question for you about how this industry operates. Uh, and I think that's been really refreshing and, you know, and dynamic and you know, it's a vital um, moment, vital opportunity you know, for us. And so it's been less about, in some ways, us keeping, it's more about us keeping pace with where our students are uh, as much as it, as it is about us kind of guiding our students to understanding these topics. Clearly, you know, to be depressing for a while, this is not a great time to be a journalist. There is, you know, that, that there are so many, it's, it's a very hostile environment out there for journalists and, and it always was, but now it's, it's more. What, what should J schools be doing to prepare their students for going out in, in a world like that? And I think it's sort of fair to say, and this is not snarky at all, in a world that doesn't have trigger warnings and that you know they're going to walk into all sorts of situations that will make them feel um, uncomfortable potentially traumatized and you know that's leaving aside the actual safety questions that's a real good one that i, I want to be brief but i think we we do have to do i know rt and da um, having workshops on you know going out and covering in live situations some of us have covered, you know, you cover, you know, the Teamsters striking in Youngstown taught me. First of all, like I get along with them so that they know I'm just there to cover the strike. Um, but we also have to give them that. We have to have some of that. We also have to share, um, again, as the professor, too, we're sharing experiences with them. You know, I'm sharing being up in the upper part of Michigan and the woman saying, when I'm looking for the lady that tells, you know, the colored lady that tells the story, I said, well, what color may she be, ma'am? Maybe I can help them look for her. So, you know, helping them you know, get through things, uh, you know, telling them. I mean, you, you have to let them know they are. You know, you're going to have, you know, the guy, the KKK guy that's trying to run me off the road. And I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, if we're both going to go off the road, you know, I'm supposed to have a photographer behind me somewhere. So you do have to share that there's a reality of things that they're going to think on their feet sometimes. Um, you do have to help them make sure they're practicing safety in terms of someone knows where they're at when they're covering things that don't get caught in the movies and being in dark shadows by yourself. You can be as dogged as you want, but you still want to have something that backs up. So I think workshops and symposiums, speakers coming, you know, things that we make sure even um, as administrators talking with our faculty, like what can we do when everybody comes in for the fall and have something with them to talk about you're going to be midterm elections this year. It's going to be emotional in a lot of places. Oh, Georgia, hmm. Okay, if you're gonna cover down here, let's think about some things. So we do make them aware, not to make them afraid, but to make sure they know they have resources and that there are things, because they may not know what will trigger someone. Um, someone told me they walked into a bank in DC and some guy just started saying, why are you in here with these masks? You don't have to have masks. And I said, well, what did you do? She said, well, I just stood there. And I said, well, did you tell the bank security that you want to conduct your business and he needs to get this person removed? And so we have to help students know they may run into those things, that their safety is important. Um, we, we all have stories of our own or colleagues, you know, who have done interesting things. I was, you know, sharing climbing a hill to try to cover a, a, a um, a uh, 18 wheeler that had turned over and I somehow got up that hill with, with the dress on, the skirt on and the shoes and all that, you know, but you know, you got up there. I could have went the other way, but I made it to the top. Um, but there are things and they're very real when they're going to cover some of these protests because that's a very uncertain time and especially we're wearing masks. So you have to help them with this, but we need their voices. We need their work. We have to let them know it's a reality. One of the things I think we have to re remember, I think I was fortunate um, when I worked at the night with a paper, the editor at the time, I did like him, he was an attorney and he was, I just enjoyed talking to him. And he said, there's, you know, there's real things that are gonna happen. You know, we were there right outside Kent State, you know, where something real happened in 1970. You know, so it's sort of like you have to let them know there are those things, but there are things they can do. They don't have to shy away and they have resources because we don't want them harmed, you know, we just lost you know, someone not too long ago in Pakistan. You know, we don't want that um, to happen, but there are a lot of people hostile to journalism right now, not just around the globe, but here in the U.S. And, you know, we 
may get to some of your questions with all this alternative news and fake news and all this, which there's either facts or they're not, but you have people will behave certain ways. And so we have to let them know that we're trying to make sure we got their back and we're showing them that. Uh, it's interesting that we say this because um, last night I started a conversation on Twitter about how journalists can ethically cover things like what happened in Texas and what happened in Buffalo and for that matter what happened in Pittsburgh, El Paso, okay. Charleston, yeah. we can go through the, the list of these places and how do you cover these stories in a way that doesn't, one, inflict secondary trauma on those communities and the survivors and also how do you protect your own emotional well-being um, in that and you know, fortunately, it, we have the Dart Center uh, for Journalism and, and Trauma, uh, and you know they've published you know helpful guides about that. And then I started getting all of this dialogue from uh, journalists about how they reacted, you know, to these. And I, I covered Charleston and Pittsburgh for the New Yorker, uh, and was thinking about like how much of that, what was being said in that Twitter discussion. Uh, reflected my own experiences uh, and what I'd seen there. And so, uh, and, and finally, I had a student in a, in a different vein this past semester who was doing a story on homelessness in Manhattan. And uh, it, it culminated in a source uh, stalking her. Uh, and, you know, she called me and, you know, we immediately, uh, you know, canceled that topic and uh, we, she, she fortunately had taken steps, you know, she was in a good position of having a parent who was a journalist who had told her some things beforehand, um, but I immediately put her in touch with three working, three women who are working journalists um, who could talk to her about steps that they had taken. You know, well, you never give them your actual phone number. There's the Google phone number. There's like all these kinds of ways that you place a layer of insulation between you and that person. But I think that's very real. <laughs> you have to. Um, I don't know exactly how you convey that, uh, other than to echo the fact that it's mindful that we have to be mindful of it. It should be something that's like the the forefront of our conversations as we're sending our students out into the field. Let me open it up to the floor. If anybody has any questions. There's a microphone on both sides. So nice to see former colleagues. Uh, I spent 19 years at the New York Times, and I'm now teaching and working with journalists uh, with Define American. I am actually um, the director of journalism partnerships. I'm Liz Robbins. But one thing that we're looking at is local journalism in North Carolina. And I want to piggyback off of Gina's question about impact. How are you all redefining impact in your schools and teaching your students beyond clicks? And how does that work with engagement? Um, and is changing the lives of a community member or members, is that the impact that you would like to see? Or are the financial realities still overtaking those when you're talking about journalism? Um, I mean, luckily for a university, <laughs> um, we can do what we think everyone should be doing. And your question just reminded me um, of some, of, a, of a, an approach that I thought could really help local journalism. And that is if every university decided to adopt the, the local news and the communities around them and saw it as their community service to support and bolster those communities, sending students to work at local publications in them or starting them or supporting ones that exist. That's a real good point in some of the stuff, um, Jennifer will call you, that we do in DC where we send the, the, the students out and they are doing stuff um, with some of the local papers and then in the communities. And it's not just the clicks, because we all know that there are things that you as an individual has done and something has changed in the community that you might not have seen at the, the time, but it did the way something was processed or done differently. 
Um, and I think so we remind them of that. But I like the idea of the more you try to get them to do something in the community while they're there, the more they can learn, you know, what um, has impact or some reach, you know, because it's a, a dress. You know, um, you're going to laugh by the time I leave here, but, you know, my wine, it's my wine and stories, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, so you put two um, indigenous communities on one reservation in Wyoming, the Arapaho and the Shoshone, which was forced upon them. They did not want to be on the same reservation. And so I told the students, you just have to go up the road. The stories are right up there. There are people who want to tell you things that are going on. You don't have to say you don't know what you can do to change because it's right there we just got to drive right up the road and, and they will explain to you and so it's always trying to get them to see that there's something right there and even if it changed where we did more and i saw the school of education partnering with some of the tribal colleges and it was just an interesting experience because i you know that's my sh go on the road and be at the cocktail party afterwards stories in wyoming because you know you had to had to fly up the Casper Road there because I wasn't driving the seven hours every time we went somewhere. Um, so I found a way to use influence to get on the president's plane every time he <laughs> went up to Jackson. I was like, I'll go if I can get on the plane. But you, you're telling the, the students a lot of it, the things are right around them. So whether it's you know a university saying, while you're here, we're going to make sure we're in the lo local community covering things. You know, look at Flint, Michigan. We were behind the eight ball as an industry and even as higher ed looking at that this water was poison for these folks and would be in these young people's bodies for generations to come. And so we didn't, when General Motors was up in Flint, it was like, oh, the love of the world, you know, you moved here and what was it, you know, USA and the Chevrolet, whatever the guy used to sing the song and everything was wonderful. And then they leave and you find out how much damage was left behind. And so now and then you get someone that thinks it's smart to start using the water that they weren't supposed to be using. And so you tell you know, everyone about when you're doing this, you're trying to help change because the younger generation was the one who is going to be impacted the most by what occurred with that, that water. So it gets back to some conversations we had earlier when someone says that's not a story in 1984. Well, yes, it is. And what we have to do is find ways to get them to push and say, you know, it will bring about change. Look at this public health crisis that we just went through with this pandemic. You know, it's, it's a joy to be here in, in New York because when I looked on TV in 2020 and so on, I'd never seen the black top of New York until 2020 because people weren't on the street. So it, it meant something impacted all of us and we need to do something different. Um, but the reason I like holding on to the local idea is just to encourage them not to, to miss what's right under them. The example I always use with them is um, Brian Stevenson. You know, as we, they all know Brian Stevenson. They know like the tremendous impact that he had. And I, and I then poll like if we were thinking about destinations for Harvard Law School grads in the year that he came out, where do you think Montgomery, Alabama, would have landed? In the top twenty-five? No. In the top fifty? No. You know, um, but it was valuable for him to go there precisely because it wasn't the kind of place where someone who had the skill set that he cultivated at Harvard Law School would typically devote their talents. And he was able to make the tremendous impact uh, that he has made precisely because he went someplace that wasn't popular. Uh, and so I, I, I give that example um, to try to talk about the utility of thinking in a broader context about you know what your career might look like where you might be able to do good work and you know perhaps if it is that you want you know that banner award or you want um you know the pulitzer or whatever it is that you you're thinking of it may well be that it comes because you went someplace where nobody else was and there weren't 50 other people who were also vying for the same story and and, and maybe there's a way to think about Recognition. If I, if I if I hear Peter correctly, it's not just that you go out and cover a local community. You engage with the community and you see the impact of their stories. You don't write and run. You write and you stay. And and really, you know, to some extent, it is what we celebrate as great journalism. My question is like, so we see a lot of these tragedies happening in the news, right? And like we see it in Uvalde, we've seen it in Buffalo, and. Obviously, this matters, and, this, and it's important to us journalists, and you want to get involved, but then you also want to report. 
And so my question is, how do you sort of, because sometimes it can seem taboo, where does activism end and journalism begin? Is that even possible? I think that's fine as long as you identify that's what you're doing. If there's a particular thing you're following with climate or a particular thing with, with gun violence. I think where I recall telling a colleague who had just got out of J school, it was during the AIDS crisis and we had had something in Michigan where someone was arrested and he spat on the officer. And we were going through this, you know, we're going to charge you with attempted this and everything. And she picked up a phone and called someone and said, oh, you know, by the way, you know, it's George Holm, this is, you know, so-and-so, I just want to talk to him and talk to him. And I overheard her and she said, well, they going to have him call me back. I said, did you tell them you're a journalist? And she says, what do you mean? I said, did you tell them you were a journalist and you were sitting here in this newsroom and that's why you're calling? And she said, well, no, they're just going to let him come. I was like, no, you got to tell them. You got to tell them. I said, you're going to regret this if you don't tell them. So where there's advocacy, you know, whatever, I still think we can do these things, but I think we have to say what they are. I think where sometimes we're challenged is when we don't want to admit that that's what you're working on or that's why you're covering. That's just a perspective I try to whenever I'm invited by faculty to speak in their class. The past decade of my career, I've been at The New Yorker, um, in a, a place where David Remnick says, you know, one's politics should be hidden in plain sight. Um, and so people know what they're getting from me. Um, but I'm always very um, diligent about telling students that if I had been at a different type of outlet, you would know a very different Jelani Cobb. You know, like I was at an outlet where I was the kind of house style allowed me to participate in you know, the political debates of the time. As in, in fact, that's what's expected. And mostly having done, uh, you know, throughout my time there, opinion writing um, and some feature writing. But so there's that kind of caveat. But I think that part of it for me is that the commitment that providing people with information um, is the basis of whatever activism comes out of it. Uh, that people are informed, people are outraged, you know, people become aware uh, of, you know, whatever, um, you know, Flint or, uh, you know, whatever. You know, when we were in Newark uh, and we were covering the police department, uh, that was literally stealing from people, you know, and that prompted people to push the legislature and push the city council. Uh, and so was I invested in that personally? Yeah, I was. I saw things that were fundamentally unfair. And if I was being honest, I, I hoped that putting that story out would push people, prompt people to do something about that situation. But I also think that there's a line because the moment at which I go out and tell people what to do about that situation, I lose credibility to tell anybody about any other situation. And so it just becomes that. Um, and that's, a, I think, always something people have to keep in mind. Um, yeah, I think sometimes our students forget that, um, that the best, most powerful thing about being a journalist is having a voice and it's having a platform to tell people what's going on and what they should be thinking about. Um, and so I do think your activism is actually through your journalism. Um, but the difference between, I see, between being an advocate and being a journalist is if you're a journalist, you're trying, you're, you're going to the story saying, what is, what's happening? What do I see? And if you in fact see that, you know, the leader of the protest is actually leading people off a cliff, you'll say he led them off a cliff or they led them off a cliff. Whereas if you're an advocate, if you're advocating for something, you might leave that part out. You, you know, you're, you already know what you're there to say. Um, so I see a difference. I, I, and that's the difference. Can, can I say one last, one last thing? This is why it's really important. Um, you know, I have the kind of lineage that I have, and I've written about Black Lives Matter from like its inception, and follow that, and I've written opinion pieces that were very sympathetic to communities that were being poorly policed. Um, and at the same time, I think sometimes people would believe that meant that I was a I was a shoe in for a particular perspective, and 
Um, if you want to believe that, that's fine. You know, but that doesn't translate into the, the work. And the way that that became apparent, and I talk with my students about this as an example, was that when I was covering George Floyd, I dealt extensively with an activist who had created an anti-police brutality organization. Her fiance had been killed, beaten to death by a police officer when she was talking to me. Uh, she was pregnant at the time. She had raised their child you know, uh, alone. And she had, in the decade since, been driven to organize around this issue. This is not unbelievable, given the level of violence and racism that was implicit in the Minneapolis Police Department, which has now been well documented. But it also didn't mean that I wasn't going to go to the police department and find out the particular details of the incident in which her fiance died. The public information officer was very eager to talk to me, forwarded me the video link of the police pursuing, after a alleged uh, suspected DUI um, incident, pursuing a person who was identified as her fiance, who evaded them by hiding in a garbage bin, in an industrial garbage bin, and then never getting out of the garbage bin, and then the time lapse of the camera showing that garbage bin taking what may have been an intoxicated person and dumping it into the garbage, in the commercial garbage. Wow. And so I come back and I'm like, this doesn't point to the police beating your fiance to death. And she was like, this is lies, people manipulated the video. And I was like, that doesn't hold up for what this is. And that is the reason why it's important to separate your ethics as a journalist from causes that you may well be sympathetic with personally. Uh, because as the activist, I'd be inclined to not tell that story. Um, and she had unquestionably done a lot of good in that community since then. But the story she was telling to people was a lie. And I think that we have to be clear about that. I want to just add quickly, that's a great example of that question of how you have to bring it full circle with activism, advocacy. And I'll give a quick example. I think it was the Washington Post a couple of days ago said, two years ago during the protest with George Floyd. So they let the story tell it. They had taken pictures of any of us who were protesting, just various people. Went back two years later, found the exact same people, and asked them what were they doing two years later. So it was done that way. Their voices were, were doing it. So with all these platforms you guys have now versus when I was in J school and I was print and it was just I stayed in that silo and didn't think about talking to anybody, anybody in broadcast or online, there are ways to make sure that it happens due to the fact that you can also let it do it and the people in the, the story and you have all these platforms to approach them in different ways. Um, and so that's the key thing why I say in letting people know, you're at least letting them know what they get. You can magically change one thing about your J school <laughs> tomorrow, but only one thing, and you're not allowed to ask for a billion dollars. <laughs> what would it be? Hugely reduce the tuition to remove the economic obstacles to people becoming journalists, to a diversity of people. She's taken the good one, so you're going to have to come to me. Well, I'm going to kind of add, add to that one. I, I, I'd like to get. Um, more faculty to be able to be more creative in smaller pockets, and some of that is getting funding to help with some of those things, because that's what our students need. They need the ability to do some of these things, so we may not can give them money in their pocket, per se, but we can cover certain things so that they can do it, and if I have faculty that can help do certain things, so they can go off and do them. I would remove the statue of Thomas Jefferson in front of our building. <laughs> and replace it with a statue of Malcolm X. Because unlike Thomas Jefferson, Malcolm X actually did found a newspaper. Okay, that is, is that for the record, is totally not what I would do. <laughs> I don't care. That is a perfect end to a wonderful conversation. We could be here another six hours, but as I say, the bar is open. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you.